What's up everyone? Welcome back. So here we go, my first video in the month of September. I'm telling you guys it's gonna be a big month. So back to the good old mob stuff. So today we're gonna talk about an absolute legend out of Boston, Spike O'Toole. So how did it really end for Spike O'Toole? Can we trust the word of Johnny Mortarano? Not likely. If Spike was hammered and coming out of Eddie Connor's Bulldog Tavern in Dorchester, then why was he clipped five blocks away on the corner of Savin Hill Ave and Dorchester Ave? Doesn't that seem like kind of a long way to follow a guy who's on foot, supposed to be drunk, staggering around, and you're in an automobile? Well, there's a pretty simple explanation for this. John Martirano is mostly full of shit. It's just like a lot of events from that time period in Boston. Bogus stories that have been told and retold for decades. Most books you read will pass on this version of events, along with Spike O'Toole was hammered at the Bulldog Tavern and Eddie Connors, the bartender slash owner, owing Winter Hill a favor, called in the tip, so a hit squad was waiting outside for him to stumble drunkenly to his demise. Then Eddie Connors himself was taken out a short while later, possibly to cut any loose ends that had to do with the crime. There's a tale that also originated from this about how Whitey Bulger was the wheelman and he didn't bring a weapon with him on the hit. When an onlooker got too close to the action, Bulger had to make a symbol of a gun with his hand and point it at the person, scaring the man away. When he got back to Marshall Motors, the headquarter in Somerville, Whitey was freaking out, screaming and cursing that he would never go on a hit again without a piece. But again, most likely a bunch of rubbish. The truth is that neither one of these guys were possibly even there. Whitey's gone now, and nobody really wants to listen to anything that Moderano wants to say. I don't anyways. Just like the first failed attempt on Punchy McLaughlin and countless other events from the 1960s in Boston, if you start digging a little bit, a lot of these stories start to unravel very quickly. Alright, but let's just backtrack here for Uno Momento. Spike O'Toole, if you don't know, which you should already, but that's fine because I'll catch you up to speed right quick. Old Spikey is a legendary tough guy from the Boston streets. He grew up in the rough and tumble neighborhood of Dorchester. Dorchester has always been a tough blue collar working class neighborhood, which back in Spike's day was predominantly Irish, Eastern European, a mix of Lithuanian, Polish, Ukrainian, there's Italians, some Middle Easterns, like Syrian and Lebanese, and of course the Greeks. Dorchester is one of the more mixed neighborhoods in Boston's pre-urban renewal for the notorious ethnically segregated city. Spike grew up in the Meeting House Hill neighborhood, which is directly across from the Savin Hill Ave neighborhood that Spike spent the majority of his adult life in. Spike O'Toole was a tough kid in a tough neighborhood. He was one of those neighborhood kids that all the other kids talked about. They looked at him with a combination of fear and awe. Kids would cross the street when they saw him coming, but they couldn't help stare at him in admiration. But he was definitely a legend in Dorchester neighborhood, even as a kid. He had a reputation as a street brawler and was already getting in trouble with the law as early as the late 1940s. Spike had a reputation as having a couple screws loose, which always makes you a little bit scarier than the average tough guy. Spike's older brother died while serving in the Navy in World War II, and his father died while Spike was young, so he didn't have a whole lot of direction growing up. Not having much interest in school, he found himself on the streets the majority of the time, and of course found himself in a good deal of trouble. By the end of the 1950s, Spike O'Toole had cemented his reputation on the Dorchester streets and now was beginning to make a name for himself throughout the city of Boston. By the 1960s, Spike had found his way out of Dorchester and linked up with the notorious Irish Charlestown mob. One of Spike's best friends was the youngest McLaughlin brother, Georgie. Georgie's older brothers, Punchy and Bernie, ran the gang. Georgie was an alcoholic psychopath, perfect companion for Spike. This guy I used to work for used to love saying, water seeks its own level. The Charlestown mob was one of the most dangerous violent crews operating in the city of Boston. They controlled the lucrative Charlestown waterfront and also committed contract killings for the Patriarcha family, the Genovese family out of New York, and basically anyone else that was paying. Between the McLaughlins, the Hughes brothers, Earl Smith, Harold Hannon, and Spike, there were no soft men in this gang. It's also important to note that no one from the Charlestown mob ever worked with the FBI. In fact, they were arch rivals of H. Paul Rico's and did not get along with Dennis Condon, which is most likely why they ended up getting wiped off the map. Georgie and Spike represented the crazy and unstable wing of an un a crazy and unstable gang. 
These were a couple guys you didn't want to bump into alone walking home on a Saturday night. I'm sure they would ruin your weekend pretty quickly. So as the 1960s progressed and the conflict between Charlestown and Somerville escalated, Spike was already firmly on the side of the McLaughlins in Charlestown. All the Charlestown guys were real shooters, but Spike O'Toole especially gave a lot of guys sleepless nights in the 1960s. He was basically fearless, and if he got you in his sights, he was rather relentless. Originally, Wimpy Bennett and his Roxbury crew were straddling the fence at the beginning stages of the 1960s gang war. They were even closer to the McLaughlin side at the onset. Georgie Boy and Spike used to hang out at Flemmy's Dudley Street Tavern in Roxbury, getting shit-faced and being belligerent assholes. Flemmy said he never warmed up to them and didn't trust them. He didn't like how heavily they drank and how nasty and volatile they would become while intoxicated. This turned off a lot of guys in the Boston underworld. Guys like Spike and Georgie and the rest of their crew made most gangsters nervous. You could be hanging out one minute, drinking and having a good time with these guys, and then the next instant they've turned on you and are possibly even trying to kill you. On one occasion, Spike O'Toole was drinking in a bar with an old friend named James John Flannery, when out of nowhere, Spike took offense to something that was said and shot his friend in the leg with a 45 caliber pistol. After their relations soured and Wimpy's crew took Winter Hillside, Spike and other Charlestown gang members started stalking the Roxbury guys. In April 1965, Spike O'Toole opened up on Wimpy Bennett as he was leaving his Mattapan home one day, but fortunately for Wimpy, he missed. Then in May 1965, a month later, the Charlestown mob caught up with Flemmy's brother, the infamous Jimmy the Bear Flemmy. Steve had warned his brother to stop going home every night at the same time for dinner. If anyone was tracking him, it would be the perfect opportunity to ambush him. On May 3rd, 1965, after receiving a phone call at his brother Stevie's Market on Dudley Street in Roxbury, he argued with the man who was most likely Spike O'Toole himself. Jimmy went home for his nightly meal. After exiting, he stepped out his front door, only to be ambushed and shot 11 times. The bear later told his brother that his shooters were Spike O'Toole, Stevie Hughes, and Punchy McLaughlin. Jimmy survived the attack, but he was... A ruin having a mesh bag holding all his insides together and tubes draining fluids out of his lungs. A doctor who lived near the bear rushed, rushed to the scene and gave him triage and first aid and most likely saved his life. After the shooting, the bear and Spike both tried to smooth things out. The bear called Spike a real nut and that's, that's really saying something. This guy calling anyone a nut because the bear was a straight psychopath. A few days after the bear was shot, someone shot out the windows of Steve Fleming's Dudley Street Market. At first he thought it was the Charlestown guys until Wimpy Bennett and Frank Salemi admitted it was them trying to get Fleming off of the sidelines and more active in the war. Spike was in and out of the clink for the majority of his adult life, but when he was out he had an ongoing relationship with the famous Boston mob groupie Dorothy Barchard. The two had a couple of children together but were never married. It seems that the two had a rather exclusive relationship, at least when Spike was out of jail. But when he was locked up, it said that Dorothy used to trick around. She's been linked to Joe Barbosa's lawyer, John Fitzgerald, the guy who got too close to the mob and lost his leg in a car bomb. She also had a, allegedly had a relationship with Ronald Dermody, and that indirectly led to his death. She's also been connected to South Shore gangster Henry Reddington. She actually is the person who found him dead. There's a story that has been going around forever that claims Spike would get incredibly jealous while Dorothy shacked up with other guys while Spike was locked up. So knowing this, Wimpy Bennett was filling Spike's head up with all kinds of talk about how Henry Reddington was hooking up with Dorothy Barcher and getting her strung out on heroin. So the tale goes, Spike, all pumped up on Wimpy's stories, got out of prison and tracked Reddington down to his South Shore Weymouth real estate office and whacked him. What was the motive for Wimpy to sick Spike on Reddington, you ask? Well, apparently Wimpy borrowed $25,000 from Reddington and didn't want to pay it back. I mean, Wimpy's a really cheap, big cheapskate. Now it's Holy in the realm of possibility that Wimpy put Spike on Reddington so he could welch on the $25,000 loan. But again, most likely another entertaining but made-up story. 
The more plausible answer is Reddington was probably killed in connection to one of the out-of-state convicts on the run that used to hide at his properties until the heat died down. He did this for a fee, of course. Perhaps Reddington was going to give information about someone who was on the run. Others even speculate that it was Dorothy Barcher herself that killed Reddington since she's the one who discovered his dead body. Spike was staying in a Dorchester apartment with Georgie McLaughlin while Georgie was on the lam. The feds and the Boston police knew Spike was somehow aiding Georgie to evade capture. At a bar, detectives questioned Spike if he knew where Georgie was, to which he replied, I don't know the bum. But of course, he was just trying to protect his buddy. Because after the feds staked out Spike and his girlfriend's pad, they realized Georgie was living there. Spike was shacking up with what the FBI referred to as a very attractive 20-something-year-old woman. I guess even though Dorothy wasn't allowed to stray, Spike himself liked a little strange. I've been trying to find a picture of this Frances Bethoni. The FBI ref- report refers to her twice as very attractive or pretty. They never say stuff like that on reports. So to say it twice, she must have been a knockout. Sadly guys, I can't find any pictures of her. Spike was not the most handsome guy around, but apparently he had some game. The feds eventually raided the Dorchester Triple Decker arresting Georgie for the murder of William Sheridan and Spike along with Bethony and Georgie's girl Maureen Delamano were arrested for aiding and abetting a fugitive. George would eventually get life in prison and by the end of the 1960s, his older brothers Bernie and Punchy had both been killed along with the Lethal Hughes brothers. Spike was a man alone on an island. Spike spent the vast majority of his adult life in and out of prison. It's probably the only reason he was still alive after the Boston Irish Gang War of the 1960s. Prison, even though it was completely miserable, was much safer than being on the streets in the 1960s if you were a gangster in Boston. A lot of these guys would repeatedly deny themselves parole so they could stay in prison. It confused the hell out of prison officials, but to gangsters who knew it made perfect sense. After Spike got out from his last bid, he was all alone. All his friends and allies were dead or in prison. Spike wanted to move on and not have to look over his shoulder for the rest of his life. So he decided to address the situation head on. Spike wasn't the pussyfooting around type of guy. Like I said, this guy was basically fearless. So one day without calling ahead, he visited Howie Winter at his office at the Marshall Motors in Somerville. No one was out front to check O'Toole and he walked right into Howie's office, unchecked and unfrisked. Howie's heart almost exploded. Spike told Howie that he didn't want any problems, and he was just going to stay out of their way, he just wanted to live his life peacefully. Howie nodded and said, yeah, yeah, whatever he could do to get him out of the office. Howie had sweat dripping down his back. Spike O'Toole could have just walked in and clipped him, no problem. Howie was irate. He started screaming at his guys. He couldn't believe O'Toole could just stroll in like that. It was very unsettling to say the least. Howie called Stevie Flemmy, who was still on the lam in Montreal, and he asked him what he thought Howie should do. Flemmy said without a doubt, kill him. He said Spike was too dangerous to have out there lurking in the street, and you couldn't believe a word the guy said. Flemmy pointed out the time that Spike shot his old pal John Flannery, just as an example of how treacherous Spike could be. So Howie made the call, Spike had to go. On September 25th, 1973, Spike came out of Eddie Connor's Bulldog Tavern and walked out over the Savin Hill Avenue Bridge to his car that was parked on Linda Lane. While opening his door, a car pulled up and an unknown assailant, most likely Joe McDonald, shot Spike several times. He was rushed to Boston City Hospital where he was stabilized and survived. Maybe this is where the Eddie Connor's tale came from. Because the first time Spike was shot, he was in fact leaving the Bulldog Tavern. I honestly didn't know that he was shot a few months before he was killed until I started digging into this topic. Maybe Martirano combined both shootings to create his version of events. Only three months later on December 1st, 1973, Spike's violent life came to an abrupt and violent end. Like I said, Martirano's version of the story is garbage. Spike wouldn't have walked five blocks and right by his house and the hit squad wouldn't have waited that long to take out a drunk guy stumbling around. He was most likely eating his last meal even though he at the time wasn't aware that it was last meal. 
at Galvin's, a restaurant on the corner of Savin Hill Ave and Dorchester Ave, where Spike was killed. Apparently, when they opened fire from the car, Spike ducked behind a mailbox for cover. The gunman had to get out on foot and finish him off. The most likely team would have been Jimmy Sims driving and Joel McDonald and Howie Winter as the shooters. That was the original core hit squad. Even though Howie's name is left out, he most likely wanted to go along because of the personal nature of the hit. Spike O'Toole was the last remnant of the Charlestown McLaughlin mob, and Winter Hill knew that they could never rest easy even with one member left out on the streets. So basically, even though these smoke stories have been around forever and are entertaining, they're unfortunately usually not true. Hopefully I brought to your attention some new information that you hadn't heard before. I'll be back again very soon with more videos. Big month, guys. If, as always, if you like this video, hit the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Leave me a comment. Always make a request. But the most important thing, guys, make good choices. Take good care of yourselves, your family, other human beings. Have a great day. Talk to you guys soon. God bless.